Hi and welcome back to another video. It's been over two years that I was looking into building my own NAS for video editing because I was changing to 4K video format at that time and then data became a lot bigger and I was running out of storage on my PC and then we also wanted to access the data from two different PCs so I ended up instead of doing a DIY NAS I just bought a Synology drive which I'm really happy about like even up to today it works flawlessly. I'm using this every single day with the SSDs in there, everything works fine. But right now I'm at a state where about 14 terabyte of the 17 terabyte are full. And then I have another about seven terabyte on my one personal PC and then another about two terabyte on another PC. And all of this data is not backupped because even though it's stored on the NAS which is running in RAID 5 it's still not backupped anywhere else which I'm a little bit concerned about. I'm not even sure if I will ever need the video data again but I was thinking about just all the data I have like the video and all the personal data and everything. I just wanted to have a separate place to store it in and right now we are talking about roughly I would say maybe 25 terabyte of data which is not too much, but still plenty. And then on the other hand, I don't need an SSD NAS for it because it just doesn't require any quick access or like the one I have from Synology with 10G LAN, I don't need that for like instant file transfer. I just want to have it running, not every single day, but to keep my data as a backup. And that's why I decided to build my own sw a small DIY backup NAS solution and that's what we're going to do today. I also want to highlight and that's one of the points that was criticized under the first NAS video like two years ago like why did you not or why did I not build my own DIY NAS? The answer is pretty simple back then I needed a quick and reliable solution which Synology definitely offered and at the same time I literally have no idea what I'm doing. Like when it comes to NAS, I just have zero experience. And even though I'm pretty sure there are a lot of like YouTube tutorials and stuff, I just, I just didn't, I was lazy. I just didn't want to do it. So I bought the Synology solution. And now I have this, which I want to build. We will in a second go over the components. First of all, I bought in total 80 terabyte of hard drive capacity, which I will think we will be left in the end with about 40 terabyte of usable data depending on how we're going to set it up. The core of this NAS will be this ASRock Rack server workstation board. I'm just going to remove all that real quick. What we have here is an ASRock Rack board with an EPIC 3101 embedded CPU. It's a pretty small CPU but it also don't need a lot of computing power. Only has four cores for threads but that is absolutely sufficient for what we want to do. When it comes to connectivity, it only features PCIe Gen 3, but we have X16 slot on the bottom and an M2 slot right here. Theoretically, well, we also have two SATA ports on here and also Ocolink, which would also offer additional either PCIe lanes or also SATA ports. But I decided to go for this simple SATA adapter, which I received from Silverstone. Also, thank you Silverstone for sending this over together with the case which we're going to use and in theory I could use up to 128 gigabyte of memory which I'm not going to use I'm only going to use 32 gigabyte in here. One more important feature for me was the BMC chip which is kind of I would explain it as an controller that allows to configure the board itself over this uh, IPMI Ethernet port. So if you would look from the side it appears like you have three Ethernet ports but only two of them are actual 10G uh, LAN ports and the other one is an IPMI port so that's basically to configure the board itself. I'm just going to use two DIMMs of these. Those are 16 gigabyte RDIMM modules. Obviously you could also like total this is 32. You could also run 64 or 128 but for my purpose that's just purely not needed. There's one more a bit special part about this board and if you paid more attention to detail you will notice that there is no normal 24 pin ATX connector for PSU on this board. And that's why not the CAD is included but this adapter because this board only runs off 12 volt. I'm not sure if it's an official 12VO board, like 12 volt only. So there has been this spec around for uh, some time now that was supposed to also make it to the consumer market that the PSU only delivers 12 volt to the board directly and not 
also 3.3 volt and 5 volt. And 3.3 and 5 volt are then made on the board itself. That's why only 12 volt is supplied to it. One more thing I wanted to highlight is that it's definitely not the cheapest solution you could get. There are definitely cheaper ways to build it and also more probably energy efficient ways to do it. For me, I wanted to try a board like this, which is more like an enterprise, not maybe enterprise, but more like a server grade board instead of a consumer board because of the BMC and those like management ports because I personally never really used them and I wanted to also learn a bit from it, gain some experience. That's why I also had to think of a cooling solution because the, the Epic embedded uh, CPU on here is not a normal like socketed CPU. It's soldered to the board and it doesn't have the normal mounting dimensions, which means that I cannot change the cooler. But if you check the cooler, just how it's built, it's definitely made for sitting in a rack that there's just some normal airflow going through, going through the fins and like the VRM cooler and everything to keep things cool. But I decided to simply get this 80 millimeter Noctua fan, which I'm planning to, I don't know, strap on there somehow with some, I don't know, cable ties, zip ties. We will find out. But since this NAS is not running 24 seven, energy efficiency was no focus for me. Otherwise you might also select different components, even though with 35 watt TDB it's certainly fine. But the board itself, there might be more efficient solutions if you would run it 24 seven, if energy is a concern. But I'm only planning to run this few days, maybe a year to just back up my data on it and then just leave it alone. I will run this 512 gigabyte NVMe Gen 3 drive and even that both speed and capacity wise is total overkill. You could definitely go for a smaller, cheaper, slower drive because that just wouldn't matter. And I'm going to put this in the slot down there. I struggled putting those zip ties underneath the heatsink, especially because there were a lot of like SMD components in the way somewhere and I didn't want to damage something. That's why I will just place the zip ties on there right now. Obviously I will have to add new thermal paste, but this way we can also look at an AMD Epic embedded. And after placing the zip ties, we'll just screw down the heatsink on top. That's for sure not the most elegant way I ever used to mount a fan on a cooler, but just has to work. Pretty sure it will do its job. The drives are Toshiba cloud scale capacity 20 terabyte per drive MG10. Mainly decided to go for them out of price performance reasons. As case, I'm going to use the Silverstone DS380, which is already an older case, but it suits our purpose perfectly. And it's also a bit difficult to film because it's so extremely dark. But yeah, I will just open the front and then you can see what I mean. Behind the front door, we can find eight hot swap bays. I'm not sure if hot swap bays is the correct term for this, but we have those plastic bays to mount our HDDs. Theoretically eight in total. And in the back, you can see if we peek in here, there is a PCB that contains the SATA data connection and also the power connection. So it will be extremely convenient to mount up to eight HDDs. So pretty much the perfect NAS case. Here we can see it again from the backside. We can see the access to the HDDs where we have to insert our power and SATA connections for data. Then we also have this additional cage right here, which would allow to mount 2.5 inch drives as SSDs or HDDs. And in the back here, we would place the board. We have a fan in addition on the bottom and that's where the PSU will go. You can also take out the entire HDD tray, case, cage, whatever, because otherwise you would not have sufficient space to mount the board and also do all the cable management and stuff. It also reveals another two fans in the back that I think should be for additional cooling of the HDDs from the side. Otherwise, because there's like no ventilation from the front, they might get too warm, but with the two fans on the side, that should be fine. Mainboard is in place. I also already attached all kind of internal headers like power switches and USB 3.0 connector and also wired the fans. Also did a bit of cable management. So it's a bit more nice and clean simply because it will be much easier for me to do any kind of maintenance. Also removed the 2.5 inch bay because I'm not planning to use any of the drives in that size. Now time to mount the PSU. It's an SX700 from Silverstone SFXL PSU. 80 plus platinum should be more than sufficient with a 700 watt definitely overkill.
almost done with the full assembly. You can see PSU is in place, all the power connections are there. I also added the SATA controller and now the only thing that remains is adding back the HDD cage and then also yeah, make all the SATA connections. Unfortunately, I just noticed that this part of the HDD cage will collide with the SFX LPSU, well, in detail with the EPS connector on the side right here. And yeah, that's not ideal, but I will just, just cut away a part because, I mean, it can contain eight HDDs and I only need four, so should be okay. But yeah, that's not ideal. Now it's looking much better HDD cage in place, also already wired up, so all the data and also current connections are done. The NAS is now running and I also attached a VGA monitor to access uh, the NAS first and see if everything works fine. Access BIOS, flash BIOS, also check if everything was detected. But we see 32 GB of memory, CPU is running and also the four HEDs were already detected in post correctly. I cannot see them here because it's uh, attached to an external controller. But the first step would be, apart from flashing the BIOS, also configuring the BMC for IPMI access. Now I'm just accessing from my main PC to the NAS using IPMI interface and launch KVM. And now I'm running the true NAS ISO, ISO, whatever, and yeah, launching this to install it. Loading the ISO over KVM actually took much longer than expected and eventually also led to some kind of error, which I was not sure about why it happened, but I then decided to simply plug a USB stick into the NAS and load it from there. TrueNAS scale, apart from that, is pretty simple to install. I selected the team group NVMe SSD as a target, created an admin account with password, and then also allowed EFI boot. A few minutes later, TrueNAS scale was installed, and I then proceeded to access this over Chrome by just dial in the IP address of my NAS. At this point, I also had the NAS connected to the normal 10G Ethernet connection and not over IPMI anymore. In the overview, everything also looked great. TrueNAS was installed with the latest version. CPU was only running with about 40 degrees Celsius in idle, so that was also great. And it only consumed about two gigabyte of memory. So we still have about 30 gigabyte of memory available. That's why we continued with setting up the storage pool. Here we are now connecting our four hard drives into one data pool, which we then later can access. For this, we simply take our four HDDs, A, B, C, and D, and assign them. Since we're using TrueNAS with CFS as file system, we can also use RAID C as configuration, which is, to say it very simplified, the better alternative to RAID 5. And in this configuration, theoretically, one HDD could fail and we could still recover the data. And effectively, we can use 52 terabyte of capacity in this configuration. After all this was set up, I continued to configure the NAS further with Niklas. We set up like monitoring and some email alarms that I will get notified if something goes wrong. And then we also continued with a small speed test. For this, I decided to take one 16 gigabyte sized video file from my Synology SSD NAS and to transfer this to my new backup HDD NAS, which we just set up. And with a speed of 250 to 300 gigabyte, I was pretty satisfied and keeping in mind that this is an HDD NAS, I think the speed is actually quite decent. That's it for my backup NAS. It was pretty easy to build it actually. Also enjoyed playing around with uh, setting this up with IPMI and all that. That was pretty cool actually. And also speed wise, because it's just below 300 megabyte per second, it's actually quick enough to work with the NAS over, well, edit over Adobe Premiere through the NAS. So that would actually work speed-wise, but it's pretty much on a limit. So the Synology NAS with the SSDs is a lot quicker. That's what we still use for the video editing. But apart from that, it's pretty quick and it was very easy to set up. I also really enjoyed building it. So yeah, that was quite cool. I hope you also enjoyed this video. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye-bye.